StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, as well as the world's first internet radio station dedicated to startups and tech companies. Today, I bring you another startup here from lovely Germany, officially headquartered in Tübingen. And Philip is my guest. Hey, Philip, how you doing? Hi, Joe. Pleasure to have me uh, to be on the show. Yeah, it's totally a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we already talked before. Um, you you tried to unfix the, the bicycle behind you so it will fall on your head during the interview and we have a nice takeout, right? That was the agreement? Exactly. Yeah, I uh, loosened the screws so everything is set up to be like six to seven minutes will fall right in my neck and then we have a very nice outtake. Uh, in order not to miss the outtakes or anything else, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button wherever you're watching this or listening to this. If we are referring to something like uh, Philip's um, LinkedIn profile, the universities or the startup, make uh, go down here in the show notes. There's always a link to our blog post where you can learn more. That said, I was a little bit surprised when I went to your CV because officially you guys are a med tech startups. But then I realized, huh, you're not a medical doctor. You are a computer scientist, neuroscience, um, PhD. But first, let us talk a little bit about what you did, because I've seen you studied computer science at Technical University Darmstadt, a university from which we already had a lot of alumni here in our interviews. Can you take us a little bit like through your life, what you've done so far and how it led you to found I to you? Yeah, I'm very happy to. So um, before I started my, uh, my studies in Darmstadt, I did an apprenticeship as a um, chemical lab assistant. Um, after that, I decided, okay, I want to do some more uh, tech stuff. So I went to, to Darmstadt University, which um, is one of the um, best universities for computer science. Um, they have a very large variety of topics and I was interested, always interested in um, what do, how do robots do? How does vision work? Uh, how do you visualize uh, things? And um, that's why I decided, okay, Darmstadt is the perfect um, place for me. So I went to, to Darmstadt and did my um, diploma back then uh, there with focus on robotics, uh, computer vision, and, um, and 3D graphics. And my uh, diploma thesis then was about uh, developing a camera system for robots that um, helps detecting things based on how you use them and not what they are. So instead of saying this is a cup, this is a, a jug, this is a plate, um, the camera system was detecting, okay, this is something I can grasp at a handle, this is something I need to grasp on the side, and saying this is more a uh, more natural way because you don't need to categorize the objects, it's more about how to use them. That sounds pretty trivial at the beginning, but I'm very sure it it gave you it gave you a lot of headaches when you tried to teach that to computer. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very uh, yeah, exciting topic and we've been working um, on a, an international um, team with people from Birmingham and from, from Italy and it was a very, very nice project and it uh, was a lot of fun back then. Uh, but then I decided, okay, I, I spent weeks and weeks on fiddling around in minor details in, uh, in camera systems for robots and said, okay, but we have very, very good camera systems, natural camera systems. So I want to understand how do they work? So how does vision work? How is it possible that I'm standing here? I can see you. You're sitting there. You can see me. You can see my background, the bike. You know, I'm in the front. The bike is in the back. All, all this kind of processing goes in, goes in your head. So, um, how does this work? So I was looking around. Okay. Where is a good place to do this? And then I found um, Professor uh, Betke in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. And um, he had a, a junior research group there back then and uh, was doing very, very exciting research in uh, computational neuroscience and said, this is exactly what I wanted to do. So I wrote him an email and explained what I did before and what I want to do now and <clears throat> was asking him for a, for a PhD position. And luckily, um, he already, he just had a PhD position open for uh, somebody with my, uh, my track record. 
So I started talking to him and um, yeah, and then we decided, okay, um, sounds like a good match. So I went to Tübingen and um, yeah, started my, my academic career then in Tübingen. We may add for everybody who's not a very frequent follower of this podcast or um, not familiar with Germany, the Max Planck Society is like an association of very research heavy institutions. And it's named after the German researcher Max Planck, who discovered, um, I, I think he laid the groundwork for um, quantum theory. Was that right? Something like this. I, I'm sorry, guys, I, I'm not a physicist. I'm I'm sorry that that's just my rude understanding. If you do have anything else to add, make sure to uh to to teach us down here in the comments. <laughs> um, and so um, basically that as we said, it's a research heavy institution. So, what was your research there? Um, so my research there was on <clears throat> how nerve cells in the brain process the information. So when you get uh, when an, an animal, a human um, is, is getting information, you have the retina in your eye. This takes the light and then transfers it into electrical signals that goes through your nerves. And um, then the signals go from um, from the, the eyes through the uh, to the back of the head and start processing there and then go into different levels um, and in your um, in your brain. May, may I add a, v a very simplified version? Basically, you um you you were working how to decode the human graphics card a little bit yeah so it was okay how do these these cells in the brain work how do they process information um what kind of of optimization do they use um so understanding how these these little cells um work and this is all the the like the basis that's going on with all the artificial intelligence systems we have now so all these like deep learning um topics where you have um, like deep fake is a very um, prominent topic now where you have all these these methods in uh, with with neural networks that can generate images that can fake uh, make fake images and can generate texts and everything so all this is um, some part of what I um, what I was doing in my uh, my PhD which I did in tubing for about yeah, five years um, first at the Max Planck Institute and then my uh, my professor went from the Max Planck Institute to uh, the University Hospital in Tübingen and uh, then the second part of my PhD I did at the university and the university hospital in Tübingen. We may also add that the University of Tübingen is one of the premier research universities in Germany. Um, we just talked before, and for example, uh, DNA was discovered there, the basics of DNA, and uh, some famous alumni like uh, Jürgen Stark, the former um, chief economist of the year. Central Bank graduated from there, as well as a lot of um, very famous people in theology, psychology, geography, and so on and so forth. So it, it, they have like hundreds of famous alumni in certain fields. So y you've been there, you studied how the brain processes visual information, and this led you in what way? to start an app uh, that cares about the eye how, how 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 did this how did this twist this turn uh, actually happen um you know, actually there is one step in between which we're currently missing so after i finished my um, phd um, i started working for a um, german consulting company um, it and uh, strategy consulting for different blue chip companies in germany and I worked there for about five years, so like did it in automotive industry, in uh, insurance industry, um, did like project management for them, um, all these um, agile transformation and everything. And after about five years, I said, okay, this is all nice. I learned a lot. It was great experience. Um, but I wanted to go back to, to where I came from, to tech, to um, be closer to, uh, to research. And um, then I was like, I just quit my job and was then about okay. What I want to do something something more meaningful with uh, with my time, and um, so I was like checking around with uh, like friends uh, what they're currently doing, where they're working, and then I was talking to a friend of mine, um, Christian, who is a professor at Korea University in Seoul, 
and was asking him, so here, um, don't you have anything uh, like a, a project where you could use somebody um, who has experience in like all these um, artificial intelligence, machine learning topics? And he said, yeah, I have a PhD student here. He's working in uh, developmental aid in his free time. And um, he's doing a project in Ethiopia where they record images of the retina um, because this PhD student is an, um, an uh, optometrician. So he knows how to record the, the retinas. And so yeah, they are really good at recording retinas. They have equipment, but they have very little um, ophthalmologists who can then um, take these images of the retina and then say, okay, um, this is um, a healthy retina. This is, uh, has some kind of disease. So this could be something where we um, apply machine learning to, to help the people there to um, make this faster and more easily. And I said, okay, this sounds like a good idea. So I just like um, booked the next flight to, to Seoul and then uh, went to Korea to Seoul and, and started working on this uh, research project there, which was about two and a half years ago. And at first we said, okay, let's, let's try something out uh, for the, the branch of developmental aid. Let's see if we can develop uh, an algorithm that's like very small and easy to use so we can uh, give it to small hospitals in, in uh, Ethiopia so they, they can use it uh, there. And then um, we thought, okay, this, this kind of works. And um, we had played around with like, uh, how can we do this on smartphones, for example, because it's uh, devices that are, they are available everywhere. And found okay, this is actually a very nice idea. And then we started talking to to people back in Germany, and they said, yeah, actually, this is a really nice idea. So this could be a really useful tool, not even in Africa, but also in in, uh, in other countries like in, in Germany, all over Europe. And said, okay, then let's let's see if we can this idea that we like came up with in uh, over a couple of years in a research project, can we turn this into a company? So I started talking to uh, Philip Behrens, who's a professor at the Eye Hospital in Tübingen, and said, yeah, this is our, our idea, and we want to like, turn this into a startup company. Um, do you want to join us? Is this a, a nice idea where you can work together? And he said, yeah, actually, the University Hospital Tübingen is very interested in, uh, in continuing working on this, this kind of uh, research and forming into a company. So we applied for um, startup funding in Germany. And um, they were also really excited about the idea, and that's why we got um, then startup funding uh, in the beginning of 2020. That is an interesting idea, basically. You went from Darmstadt to Tübingen to Korea just to get back to Tübingen. That, that, that is quite an interesting journey. When you've been talking about, uh, like, recognizing diseases in your eye, that's basically what we're talking about. I had two thoughts. First... Could you like also integrate this in a smart mirror? For example, you, you look in the mirror every morning and just, uh, by the snap of a finger, basically every morning, your smart mirror checks your eyes. Is that possible? And secondly, um, is it also possible to diagnose other diseases, not of the eye, uh, when you're scanning the eye before we get into the nitty gritty details of what you guys are actually doing? Um, this would actually be a really great um, application to have this in a smart mirror. The problem is um, to see the retina, so the back of the eye. You have to go through the pupil and then see the back of the eye. And for this, you need um, some kind of lenses, so you need some kind of optics. So the very simple one is, is something like this here. So this is a, a mobile fundoscope where you can uh, put in a camera in the back and um, have then um, the, the smartphone and then record the retina with this. So it's, it's not possible to like have a mirror and then just have a camera chip there, which sees through this very tiny black spot in my eye. Um, so you need some kind of, of optic to uh, put in front of the eye and record with the retina. Um, that's why this, um, like the, this mirror um, idea is, is actually great and might work for uh, diseases of the outer part of the eye, but not for diseases of the retina. And for the other part, um, actually, yes, um, the retina is very interesting because it's part of the uh, of the central nervous system. Uh, central nervous system. Um, so you can see also bl fine um, blood vessels and everything um, without having to penetrate the uh, the body. So you can see the very fine uh, structure of the um, um, of the vessels of the blood vessels, and um, this gives you a lot of information about other diseases too. For example, hypertension. Um, so there is a lot of potential in using images of the retina for diagnosing different kind of, um, of diseases. So I think um, later we can go a bit more in detail on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, now talking about 
your company. Uh, we already realized you are using smartphones to scan the eye. And you've shown for everybody who's not watching this as a YouTube interview, but listening to it as an audio podcast, you showed something you had to put on the camera of the smartphone, which more or less looks like a little handgun. And with this, you can scan the eye. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit more about what you guys are actually doing, what setup you need, and where your app is currently um, in use, and how you guys are working with this and with this data? Yeah, sure. Um, first part, uh, funny that you say it looks for you like little handgun. I think that's your your Texan background um, speaking there. Because most people I talk to, they say it looks a little bit like like a hair dryer, like a big hair dryer. Um, but uh, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, actually, it is is a small device, a handheld device, the size of a, of the of the hair dryer. Um, hair dryer. And um, this is uh, more or less, simply speaking, just a couple of, of uh, lenses that. Um, focus the the light from from the eye and um, that goes into the eye to get the images back. And what we are um, currently doing is we're on, on an early stage, so we're currently in the um, development stage together with the eye hospital in Tübingen, um, where we um, develop the smartphone app that helps recording the images because you need to go through the pupil as it's a very small. Um, small part, so you need some kind of assistance to uh, use this this device to record the um, the retina properly. And then once you have a, a properly recorded retina, um, this image then gets analyzed by different kind of um, algorithms to see, okay, is there um, this kind of disease or that kind of disease? And the application we are going for is um, not that um, the every person, every customer just uses this device for themselves, but we want to um, empower. Uh, general physicians and caretakers with this kind of device. Because we believe artificial intelligence, especially in the medical field, um, is something that still needs a, um, uh, like a, a last decision made from medical experts. Um, so having this, this method saying, okay, you have this and this disease, just without uh, medical supervision, I think uh, can be kind of, of dangerous for, for misinterpretation. Um, so that's why our belief is uh, we should use this as a, as a smart tool to make doctors more powerful than they currently are um, and um, make uh, examinations uh, more easily accessible. Currently, if you want to get this kind of retina examination, you have to go to an, to an ophthalmologist's office, which there are, at least in Germany, we have 80 million, or uh, more than 80 million people here and only 8,000 ophthalmologists in Germany. So to get to an ophthalmologist, um, you usually have to drive a long distance, then you have to wait in the in the waiting room, and um, if uh, and the, the the cost is a lot higher for the health insurances because um, well, experts are more expensive. And um, if you see okay how many people are um, at risk for retinal diseases, which are people um, over a certain age, which are diabetic people, or as I said before, people with high blood pressure. So this is a large part of the of the German uh, population and worldwide population. Diabetes is um, is a very dangerous disease all over the world. So um, there are a lot of people who might benefit from these uh, like regular and easy checkups. And we believe if this checkup can be done by your family doctor or by, by a caretaker um, in, a, in a nursing home, uh, that this is a lot more accessible and you can find uh, retinal diseases um, a lot easier and a lot faster. And this is why our approach is we want to empower these people with the software we uh, develop for the smartphone so they can use uh, their smartphone or their, their office smartphone together with these um, these uh, mobile fundus cameras, which are regular um, medical devices you can, can buy off the shelf, and then uh, do these kind of examinations to, to see, okay, is there um, some indication of a disease? And if yes, then they should go to the expert for the treatment. So we don't want to replace ophthalmologists and experts. We just want to um, add an additional layer of checks between doing nothing and going to the expert, because there, there is a lot of necessity in between and, and that's why we think this is a very good idea, um, which is yeah, useful um, in um, highly technological countries like in, in Germany or in Korea or all over Europe, but also in, in other countries where you don't have medical infrastructure, like in um, developing countries in Africa. Um, let me try to poke a little bit on your software. How good is your software? And uh, how do I see the results? Is this basically 
like a traffic light, green, everything's fine. Orange, you may develop something and red, you should see an ophthalmologist or is it something a little bit more dedicated? And how high is your confidence in this software tool? Meaning, um, does it like always get the uh, retina diseases? Um, so the quality of these AR algorithms to detect, for example, diabetic retinopathy, this is um, like the, one of the first diseases that uh, we are currently uh, working on. Um, there the algorithms are um, even on, on an expert ophthalmologist level or even better. So you're in the 98, 99% of um, correct detection, which is more or less the same as, um, as expert doctors can recognize these diseases. Um, but we are actually going for this kind of traffic light um, approach to say, okay, for um, caretakers and family doctors, it's not important to, to see, okay, this is a stage three or stage four retinopathy. For, they, for them, it's important, okay, this is a, a, this is a um, clinical case, so this kind of person needs treatment for the retinopathy. So um, this uh, is then like a red case or, okay, there seems to be some first indication on, on retinopathy. Uh, maybe check with the, the general health of that person. So if there might be a good reason for a checkup or green say, okay, everything is fine. So this is the, the recommendations that our, um, our software gives, but still has in the back all the, the information that if the, um, if the doctor needs some more information, then um, he or she can get a full report on everything. But the first indication should be, okay, this is um, nothing, or there is some, might be some case, or this is a, a very secure case, so this person needs immediate treatment. I see, I see. And um, second question would be, how does it proceed? As, as you said, okay, let's assume I get this eye scanned, uh, there is like a red light, and what happens then? There is a caretaker and he says, you should go see an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, or do you actually enable the uh, people to go there with the data, uh, ophthalmologist to access the data? Do you work together with, for example, a hospital who gets uh, like if approved all the pictures? How do you guys work then? So um, currently, um, so we're still in the developing phase, so this is not uh, not yet fully um, implemented. But our um, current plan is that we um, that the, the recordings you do uh, take, they go into the uh, patient management system of the doctor's office that you're at. So, for example, you're at your family doctor, they take the image and then um, they get a full report, just like for an EKG, and store this in your patient file. And then when they say, okay, there seems to be a case, you should go to see an ophthalmologist. They can um, do the report and then send it e either uh, digitally or just do a printout and hand it to you, which you can then bring to the ophthalmologist. But uh, then the ophthalmologist would do uh, a full examination anyway, because um, ophthalmologists have uh, a lot, have a, a more high quality equipment. They have very big, expensive stationary cameras, um, which cost several hundred thousand euros, um, and then do with this kind of special cameras the examination. Because devices like these here, they are in uh, um, their cost, cost a few hundred to up to like one or two thousand euros. So the, the quality of these is um, totally sufficient and very good for doing quick checkups. But if you want to have this exact um, distinguishing between, okay, this is a stage three versus stage four, or maybe there's some, some uh, other minor details. So for this, you need these, these big uh, 100,000 euros cameras. And this is what the, the ophthalmologists in their office have. They do the recordings with this, and then they can uh, very finely decide, okay, what kind of treatment do you need? I do believe even the ophthalmologists like it because it only brings like people to their uh to their attention that actually have a suspicion to be really sick their retina really sick and you already get an indication where to look um i do believe that and that's a big plus especially if you also get a report and then you can crank up your expensive equipment that is pretty awesome um let's talk a little bit about your company how many guys are you right now and how are you financed um so currently um we're a team of um five in our uh, six in our company five uh yeah um five plus uh plus working student and um yeah we um we were founded last year in the beginning of 2020 um then because of the pandemic um not everything was working um as planned so the um our our growth was a little bit um blocked by this 
And um, now we are, uh, we finally um, closed our pre-seed finance round. Um, so we're currently pre-seed financed with, uh, from the, um, here from Bank in Germany. And um, we have now the, the founder team um, are the three founders, Bjorn, Christian and me, all with a more technical background. And then we have um, another members with uh, a more uh, medical business background um, in our team. And um, yeah, this is uh, the, the current state and we are still looking for uh, more people and especially for the regulatory part here in Germany to get um, our software um, certified as a medical product according to the uh, European uh, medical device regulation um, and um, some more assistance in, in different fields. So um, for people interested in working with us, you can check our websites. Um, there we have some information on, on open position now. Mm -hmm. I see. And everybody who'd like to learn more can go down here in the show notes. We do have a lot of Wikipedia articles on retinopathy, uh, ophthalmologists, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, we also have your personal LinkedIn profile and people will realize I always call you Philip, but you're Jörn Philip. Uh, but we agreed just to call you Philip and that's totally fine. And the people will also find your LinkedIn profile down here. Only thing left for me to say is thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you as a guest and best of luck for the continued development of your tool. Do you have like any, any timeline in mind when you will be registered as an official medical device, medical software? Um, yes, yeah, so our plan is to um, get the certification done by the end of uh, 2022. Um, so about the end of next year. And um, um, so this is um, yeah, the current plan to, to have it done ready and started working in 2023 with the, uh, the first doctors, uh, most likely in uh, southwestern German part. So starting locally and then expanding to uh, Germany, uh, Europe, and then maybe in two or um, in three or four years um, also internationally. Well, best of luck and hope to have an update with you guys as soon as we have... Um as soon as you're expanding internationally. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure to be here. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English. But you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.eo podcast or check for the StartupRad.eo internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.eo skill as well.